Hi, today we're going to talk about the origin and evolution of vertebrates. So we ended with invertebrates and invertebrates are, um, you know, one of those basal lineages. You start with sponges, you work your way up. So now when we talk about vertebrates, we're not really talking about vertebra. I know you think you're thinking of vertebra, you're thinking of um, those little knobby things in your spine right back here. but that isn't necessarily what it means to be a vertebrate. To, we usually use the word vertebrate to mean anything with a spinal cord. So spinal cords actually didn't start as spinal cords. They started something called the notochord and you have a notochord or at least you did when you were in development um, in the womb and so you know we're thinking of that. We're thinking of something with a spinal cord, that connection from the rest of the body to the brain. Um, early vertebrates were aquatic. They lived in salt water, specifically in oceans. Um, they didn't start coming to land until about 365 million years ago. Uh, today we have six living lineages of aquatic vertebrates and three lineages that have moved onto land that are terrestrial. Do note of those three terrestrial lineages, which we will be talking about, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, that birds are actually considered reptiles. Birds are um, <clears throat> extraordinarily similar to reptiles. Um, their feathers are kind of like extended scales. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, and if you want to see a tiny fish, you should look up that smallest Schindlera brivipingius because it is just the size of an index finger. Not even. It'll fit right here on an index finger. All right, so looking at this basal lineage, you can see on your screen and to the left, right, you get this ancestral deuterostome, and you're thinking, what the, uh, does that mean to have an ancestral deuterostome? Um, that means a starfish, <laughs> basically. Um, something that is resembling to a starfish. A chordata, those are things like sea squirts. Um, they are very interesting, uh, but they don't have true vertebra that is reserved for, right, you, the human, and sharks, and that sort of thing. Um, and do note the most complex of the chordates are, remember as you read this cladogram, that each time you see one of those slashes, like the notochord, the vertebra, the jaws, the lungs, the lobed fins, digits with limbs, those are all nodes on the cladogram. And those nodes allow you to see those common shared characteristics. All right, this is what a notochord looks like. You can see most ev juvenile vertebrates, even today, have this kind of look. Okay, there's the hollow nerve cord, the notochord that connects everything, some muscle segments that are feeding into the nerve notochord because, I mean, what's the notochord going to register if there's nothing connected to it? Um, so it does have this kind of basic look. There is uh, one species that looks like this as an adult or type of species, I should say, and those are the lancelets. And the lancelets look kind of like leeches. Um, but they are not parasitic. Um, they actually are suspension feeders, so they draw food in. Um, they're endangered, these little fish, uh, but they're very common actually off the coast of Florida. And in this case, that becomes a problem um, if you remember that Florida has that huge floating island of plastic, so the landslit's habitat, one of the few places in the world where they're still living, um, is extremely endangered. The tunicates, um, the tunicates, the sea squirts, they also have a notochord. They're often confused with sea cucumbers and sea anemones. Um, remember, sea anemones have those tentacles that are waving around like a jellyfish. They're related to jellyfish. They're in the Cenardia family. Um, and sea cucumbers are more closely related to a sea star or starfish. Um, they're long and look like a cucumber. Um, but the thing all three of these things have in common is that they tend to squirt water if you poke them. Um, but the tunicate you can actually tickle and have it squirt water because it has 
that uh, sensory, right, that notochord that allows it to adapt to sensation. And so since it's adapting to sensation, the sea squirts are actually responding to that touch and squirting water like predator, 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 even though, you know, you probably don't want to eat it as a predator. Okay, so now we're getting into chordates with a backbone. Um, so things these things have in common are Hox genes. So now we're starting to get the genes you need for brain development. The more Hox genes you have, the more developed your brain is, the higher your order of thinking. Um, and so do keep that in mind. So the hagfishes and the lampreys are the most basal of the animals with true vertebra. Um, they don't have a true backbone. They only have a few vertebra. Um, and they are jawless and they kind of look a little creepy, but that's okay. Hagfishes especially look like a hag, right? That's how they got their name. So here's your hagfish. It kind of looks like a weird mix between an eel, a snake, and something out of a horror movie. Um, and it does excrete a lot of slime. You can see those slime gla glands being pointed out in the photo to the left. Um, and so their skull is made of cartilage. It never fully calcifies into bone. Um, they do have that snake-like undulation. So when they move, they're going back and forth like this, right? They're not going straight. Um, it's kind of a slithering motion. Their brain's pretty small. They only have two Hox genes. There are 30 species. And the slime they excrete is protective, right? To prevent um, being uh, desiccated or eaten. It prevents things from latching on, right? Their mouths slip off. Um, and the slime's actually being researched to be used as a space-filling gel as an alternative to, like, packing peanuts and airbags um, and to be used to send astronauts into outer space, right, to make sturdier seats so that the astronauts don't go flying everywhere. So it has quite a few commercial applications. Lampreys are more like a leech. They're often confused with anglerfish. There's 35 species, um, but they're parasites. They suck the blood out of other fish. Early vertebrates um, actually did have skulls uh, starting about 500 million years ago. Somewhere along the way the lampreys and the hagfishes actually lost their skulls so that's actually um, almost a regression in the evolutionary time scale. Um, and, but you do see chordates without skulls as far as 530 million years ago. And of course, with the advent of a skeleton, you start to get the advent of teeth, right? So this dental element, right? The teeth. Okay, um, bones and teeth evolved as a way to eat, right? Can you crush something? Can you grind something? That gives you more food options than if you're just trying to slurp something down. Um, Mineralization of the skeleton is actually fairly recent. Sharks, for example, actually still completely have cartilage uh, for their skeletons. They don't have bone. Remember, um, even in mammals, uh, babies are born without any bone. They're born with cartilage, and that cartilage slowly hardens, or it's often called mineralization or calcification, um, because uh, the bone is formed from calcium, right? So the babies are born with cartilage. They drink milk, right, breast milk formula, whatever. It has a lot of calcium in it. That calcium goes into the cartilage and hardens it, creating bone. So it's called calcification or sometimes mineralization um, because calcium is a mineral. Um, so it takes in a mammal about two years for that cartilage to fully convert to bone in a human um, or something larger like a horse or a dog. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind, right? That it takes a while for that, that calcification to occur. Um, and sharks never get that. The only thing that ever calcifies in a shark is their teeth. So, you know, something to think about. Now the um, pterospis is uh, one of those things with protective armor, so it actually ended up with kind of bone on the outside. Looks like an upside down shark. Um, so that's something to think about as well. All right. So, the nastosomes, do you have a jaw? So jaws are going to include us. Um, so these are the rest of the lineages. They're gonna be both aquatic and terrestrial. Nastosomes just means they have jaws. So we're talking about sharks, we're talking about rays, we're talking about 
amphibians, we're talking about reptiles, and we're talking about mammals. Um, so literally jaw mouth, right? And you have a jaw, right? Uh, so look at that creepy nastosome on the right. Um, so what you start seeing with nastosomes is duplicated Hox genes. So now we're getting more and more Hox genes for greater development of brain function. Um, and the forebrain, where logical thought occurs and the search for food is becoming larger. Um, fossilized nastosomes start appearing about 440 million years ago uh, and became modern lineages about 420 million years ago. And so this is when you're starting to see something like um, the strange fish that you may have talked about in Bio 111, right? Uh, the cyclopenth, uh, which was alive with the dinosaurs. So this is about when that fish lived. So sharks, rays, and relatives, they're the largest cartilage fish. Um, and they do sometimes have calcium, but it never truly hardens the cartilage into bone. Um, in fact, it's interesting to note that when you're talking about the chondrithians, right, the sharks and the rays, that the cartilage is actually a regression. It's a derived trait. Um, so animals with bones came about, right, think like the coelacanth, right, that strange fish. Um, and then they started to come backwards, right? It was more beneficial for a shark to be more flexible and bendy so it could get food and attack predators. I've seen sharks practically bend themselves in half to catch a fish and eat it. Um, and so they do still have bone in their teeth and their scales. There are about a thousand species. Um, so there's this myth that sharks can't stop swimming or they'll die. And the reason that come, came about is because sharks, um, if they stop swimming, they sink. They don't die, they sink. And most species do that on purpose. They rest on the sea floor. Um, and part of the reason they sink if they stop swimming is they have this really fatty liver to help keep them buoyant but they're also really heavy. So if you, it's kind of like an airplane. If the airplane stops flying, right, with the motor, it's just gonna crash. So with a shark, if they stop swimming and moving, they sink. And you might wanna do this on purpose. Maybe the good food's on the seafloor. But if you get something like a great white shark where its mass is just so big, then they can't stop swimming um, because when they sink, they actually do die because their mass is so great they can't get back up again. Um, but if you have something like a little tiger shark, it's going to want to sink, rest on the seafloor, take a nap, and then it's just going to swim right back up. Um, so that leads to the question, well, how do great white sharks sleep? They take little two-minute naps. They, they swim around, they eat something, and then they doze off. And then they pop right back awake because they've started to sink, and they're like, oh, no, and then they start swimming, and then they doze off. And then they pop back up. Do you see how this goes? Okay. Most sharks are carnivorous. They see in shades of gray, and they have this basic body structure, right, that the black, re black, tip, black tip reef shark has. So they have the pectoral fins, the dorsal fins, and the pelvic fins, and that's actually very similar to what you find on a fish as well. Um, and so when you dissect your perch, you will see that. Um, so sharks are interesting in that they can be oviparous, ovoviviparous, or viviparous. Now this is probably the first time you've heard these words. So here's what they mean. Oviparous, pretty straightforward. They get fertilized internally and then they lay an egg. Think a chicken, right? The rooster has sex with the chicken, the hen, and the hen forms the egg around the sperm and lays it, and then babies develop. Okay, that's oviparous. Let's go to the other extreme, which is also fairly simple to understand, and that's viviparous. With viviparous, you have live birth, right? So think again, you have sexual intercourse, and then voila, X amount of time later, anywhere from, you know, three months uh, for a dog, sorry, anywhere from, um, you know, three weeks for a mouse to nine months for a human to over a year for an elephant. Um, so you get that live birth. And some sharks, like the great white, are do that. Um, the other option you can see with sharks is the ovoviviparous, and this one's kind of creepy. So the sharks have sex, the sperm gets formed into an egg, just like you would with that chicken, right, the oviparous, but then the mother shark keeps the eggs 
inside of her, self-contained for protection until they hatch. So there's no nutrient exchange like you do with viviparous, but there's no abandonment like with oviparous. So you've got that kind of like hybridization of some maternal care, but not a ton of maternal care. Okay. Rays are bottom dwellers. It's easy to step on them when you're in the ocean. Um, you get told to do this kind of like ray shuffle if you're in the water with, where there are a bunch of rays. Um, the southern stingray is not that dangerous. They're very friendly. They're kind of like puppies. If they're used to humans being in the water with them, they actually will come up to sniff you. Um, and as long as you hold still, there's no way you can get stung. In fact, you can even pet them from head to tail. Um, gently under supervision of someone who knows what they're doing uh, and not cause any problem. When you get something like that, right, um, they're fine. So you might think, well, what about Steve Irwin? He died from a stingray. Yeah, he died because he was one playing with an Australian stingray with a really sharp toxic barb as opposed to the southern stingray, which is benign and its barb isn't toxic. Um, and he hugged it. So with a stingray, there are barbs on the tail. You can actually see it's, it's next to the tail on this slide. And it's going parallel to the tail. So the tail's here and the barb is here, okay? And so the only way to really get that barb in is to like grab the tail. It's meant as a benign way to stop predators, right? If a shark comes at you and latches onto your tail, it's gonna get that barb in its mouth and it's going to leave you alone. Um, but Steve Irwin gave the ray a hug and the barb went straight into his heart. In fact, there are a lot of um, doctors that think he might have survived if he hadn't pulled the barb out because he did damage to his heart when he did that. If he had gone to the hospital for surgery with the barb in his heart, he probably would have survived. All right. Um, chondrithians are subject to overfishing. Um, you do eat shark often. Um, if you eat a scallop at a restaurant, what you're actually eating is cut up shark meat because they have a similar texture. Sometimes the restaurants don't even realize that what they've served you is shark, which doesn't really say a lot for the quality of the restaurant. Anyway, um, in 2012, it was reported that shark populations divine declined by 95% in the Pacific. And a lot of that was due to trawling. So they lost their habitats. They lost their food sources. So even if the sharks didn't get <clears throat> fished directly, um, their food got fished to the point that they starved. Right, the ray finned and lobe fishes. So these are traditional fish. Um, you can see the yellow fin tuna um, to the left. This is very popular. It's called um, hamachi or yellowtail in uh, sushi restaurants. Um, and so now we're into fish that have a true ossified, uh, right, that mineralization, that calcification, bony skeleton. Uh, they do breathe by drawing water in over their gills and then absorbing that oxygen into their lungs from there. Um, they have a swim bladder and an air sac to maintain buoyancy. So fish can stop swimming and still start swimming again. There's nothing like um, the sharks and their fatty liver. Uh, lungs actually arose before swim bladder, so they could breathe before they could stay buoyant. Um, I will say most fish are oviparous, they lay eggs. This is the basic anatomy of a trout. Um, so you can see they have the nostril, and you're thinking, why do they need a nostril if they have gills? But they can actually get some oxygen in through their nostril, um, and it can help them su create suction to get water over their gills faster. They have a little brain, a little spinal cord, right? They have a kidney, which does not look like our kidney by any stretch of the imagination. That swim bladder is the big white sac, right, that they can fill or close as needed to go up and down. They have a variety of fins, including the caudal fin, which they use for steering. Um, they have a full digestive system. They have gonads, which are their reproductive organs. They're pink and mushy. Um, so, you know, a ton of interesting features that you'll see when you dissect your fish. Um, environmental, most species are endangered from overfishing. So when we talk about ecology, we'll mention that um, trawling is one of the biggest threats to the ocean. Everyone always talks about the rainforest, right? And it's horrible. We should not cut down the rainforest. But we actually trawl 150 times more 
in the bottom of the ocean destroying aquatic habitats than we do cutting down rainforest 150 times. So we're cutting down 14 million acres of rainforest every year. And then we're trawling 150 times that at the bottom of the ocean. So just put that in perspective for a minute. We need the ocean. Fish are a huge food source. There's water recycling, right? There's salt. There's many, many things that impact you that you don't necessarily think about. Um, and those aquatic environments are really facing water pollution. And of course, the diversion of river, rivers that's interfering with um, food sources as things wash in. Um, and even migration and reproduction, when you talk about something like salmon that's born in a freshwater river, comes down river, lives their adult life in the ocean, and then goes back upstream to lay their eggs and then die. So here are some examples of some fish, right? You get the red lionfish, which looks really big and scary, like, don't eat me, don't eat me. You get something like the seahorse, um, which is interesting because the female lays the eggs into the male's pouch. So again, you get that uh, parental protection, um, but the male actually carries the eggs to term. So it's almost ovoviviparous. Um, Except that the females laid the eggs and abandoned them, and the father is actually the one that's keeping the eggs. And then, you know, you get something like an eel, which looks more like a snake, but, you know, he's, he's fine. He's doing his thing. Okay, so <laughs> the lobe fin fishes are things like the coelacanths, which we talked about um, as living fossils in Bio 111 the lungfishes and the tetrapods. So let's do a quick video on the lungfishes. Lungfish are an ancient fish that can be found in Africa, South America, and Australia. They live in the murky margins of swamps and rivers. But sometimes water can dry up during droughts. Lungfish have found a way around this fundamental problem. Their strange solution has enabled them to survive for more than 300 million years. When their watery home vanishes, lungfish can turn to breathing air, like a mammal. Droughts can last for years on end. So the lungfish digs down in mud to create a burrow, where it coats itself in mucus, which dries to a leathery body bag, protecting it from total dehydration. The lungfish then shuts its system down and waits. It can survive for years, if that's what it takes. The lake and the fish may be long forgotten, but the lungfish will still be there. Its metabolic rate drops by 60%. What little energy it does need comes from slowly consuming its own muscles. It effectively eats itself to survive. When the drought-breaking deluge finally comes, the lungfish awakens from its dormant state, reanimated and ready to roll. On an evolutionary scale, this problem-solving was a game-changer. It has kept the lungfish alive since before the dinosaurs. There you have the lungfishes. Um, so all of the lungfishes, the coelacanths, um, and of course now we're getting into tetrapods, terrestrial descendants, um, are considered lobe fin fishes. So remember, you are a fish. Okay, interesting things to note, the lungfish and the coelacanth are both living fossils. Um, you've seen about the lungfishes, just to put this in perspective, this is the coelacanth. So you can see the fossil of the coelacanth on the left and then the modern day coelacanth on the right. Um, they are fairly large fish and they are very, very 
uh, cool. They look exactly like um, their fossilized counterpart. And for years, it was thought that they were extinct. And then in 1920, a woman in South Africa found one. Um, so on Christmas Eve, no less. So it's just very, very interesting. Okay, the Tiktaalik is very similar to the coelacanth, but unfortunately it did go extinct. Um, the Tiktaalik is the link between fish and tetrapods. It's a fish that walks kind of like a lungfish, but it has a true uh, digitized limb. You can see its wrist towards the back on the right. So tetrapods are nastosomes with limbs. Um, traditionally they have four feet, though of course there are some adaptions, like you the human have two feet and two hands. Um, the head is separated from the body with a neck. The neck's gonna have vertebra. Um, in humans, your cervical vertebra in your neck, you're gonna have anywhere from uh, two to four, depending on how long your neck is. Um, so and just keep that in mind. Um, adults do not have gills unless they're a fully aquatic species like a dolphin or a whale. Um, and the embryos do have gills, however, which is always kind of interesting to note. Um, so here you're starting to see white bars indicate that there's fossils, but also a lineage that goes all the way to modern day. So like the lungfish, as you can see, they start a really long time ago and they come all the way up to modern times. Um, and then you get something like amniotes. There are fossils of amniotes out there. They're not the same as the ones we have today. Think like a dinosaur, um, but they do exist. And then of course the lineages descend into the modern times. Okay, the amphibians. On the right, you have the oxytal. The oxytal is um, the only fully aquatic salamander in the world. Aren't they cute? They come in cotton candy colors like pink and blue and white. Um, there are over 6,000 species of amphibian worldwide. Um, they're traditionally dual-lived where they have their juvenile state in the water and then they do come on to land as an adult. Um, but like the oxytal, some of them are fully aquatic or fully terrestrial, like a toad. Um, they like damp habitats. Their skin has to stay very moist and that's partly because they do gas exchange through their skin. So their lungs are really small and almost underdeveloped because they're doing this gas exchange through their skin. Um, and then of course they are oviparous, which if you recall, oviparous means um, that they use external fertilization and they have eggs. Okay, so salamanders. There are 550 species of salamander worldwide. 32 of those are found in Western North Carolina. In fact, there are 14 species of salamander found only in Western North Carolina. Um, that's partly because we are geologic hotspot, right? We've talked about geologic hotspots before. It's the basic idea that here in Western North Carolina, we have this explosion of diversity of life. There's only three hot spots in the world. One's in China, one is here, and one is in northeastern Africa. Um, so here you're going to see these like lizard-like things that walk with a sway. Um, and they're pretty benign. Though I will say uh, North Carolina in our geologic hotspot is famous for the fact that we have the only salamander in the world that bites. Um, it's one of the giant salamanders. There's three giant salamanders globally. There's the salamander in China that's actually called giant salamander. Um, it gets over five feet in length. It's the size of a small um, alligator or crocodile. Um, the second largest salamander in the world is the Japanese giant salamander found in Japan. Um, and it can get up to four feet in length. And then here in North Carolina, we have the third largest salamander in the world, and it is the hellbender. And the hellbender can get up to three feet in length, and they are also the only one that bites. Um, hellbenders are endangered. So if you get bitten by a hellbender, you can't just kill it to get it off. Um, hellbenders have this mechanism where once they latch onto something, they can't let go until they swallow. Um, and so obviously a three foot salamander could cause a very painful bite, but they cannot swallow you whole because you're much bigger than them. And 
So, since it can't let go until it swallows, you really have to locate a vet who knows what they're doing to put the salamander to sleep and force its jaw open so you can get your hand out. Um, not a pleasant experience. Frogs, there's over 5,000 species of frog worldwide. The majority of amphibians in the world are frogs. Um, 14 species are found in Western North Carolina, none of which are poisonous. Uh, we do have tree frogs in North Carolina, but not in Western North Carolina. So you're going to find green tree frogs on the east coast of North Carolina near the ocean. Um, in fact, I found one on my parents' coffee pot once when I was um, visiting their beach house. It was very, very cute, but it did not belong on a coffee pot. I put it outside. Um, the adults do not have tails. Do note with frogs, if they are brightly colored, avoid them. Avoid them because they're going to excrete toxic chemicals in their skin. All right. Um, some frogs do have um, color patterns that can be for camouflage. Think like a toad. Do note, toads are a type of frog and they are completely adapted for life on land. If you put a toad in too deep of a water, it can actually drown because toads don't swim naturally. Um, and toads tend to have rougher skin with more pockets to kind of hold in moisture because they are living completely on land. Um, so hence the witches and the toads and the warts, right? Because they're ugly. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Poison dart frogs are called poison dart frogs, right? Because they excrete that poisonous toxic chemical from their skins. Um, and native indigenous tribes to different areas would actually take darts and gently rub them on the frog to get the poison onto the dart and then use it to shoot at their enemies. Consequences of being shot with a dart like that could be anywhere from temporary paralysis to almost instantaneous death to very, very painful long drawn out death, depending on what they were going for at the time. So here are some interesting frog adaptions. You can see tadpoles and the kind of half frog, half tadpole thing going on um, during metamorphosis. Uh, in C, you can see frogs having sex, which is super uh, cool. They look kind of like anything else. So there you go. Um, and then on the right, those weird bumps on that frog, that is a female frog um, that has laid her eggs under her back and is carrying them for protection until they hatch. So this is an example of ovoviviparis in a frog. There are very few species of salians. Uh, we don't have any in this area. They do resemble earthworms. They're often mistaken for earthworms in tro tropical climates. So if you ever are traveling to somewhere very warm and very moist, uh, occasionally south, southern Florida will get some coming in on cargo ships, but they look like giant earthworms. There you have it, they're an amphibian. All right. And now we get into the amniotes. So these are things with amniotic fluid. So true uh, reptiles with their amniotic fluid in their eggs. These are the kind of eggs you want to eat, right? So if you think of a chicken egg and you, you crack one into a bowl, you have the egg white and the egg yolk. Now the yolk is the food for the developing embryo, right? The little red spot you might see is where the sperm would come in. It's where it's fertilized. It's called a blood spot. And then the white is the amniotic fluid. You get amniotic fluid in everything from reptiles, which includes the chicken, to humans and elephants. Um, and humans, the amniotic fluid goes outside of the placenta to help protect the developing fetus. So, um, tetrapods with terrestrial eggs, so reptiles, birds, mammals, the eggs have four parts, the amniote, which we just talked about, the chorion, which is for gas exchange. So if you hard boil an egg and you start to peel it, do you know that membrane that starts to peel off with the shell? That is the chorion, the yolk sac, and then the alanoi for waste disposal, which is the little black speck as opposed to the little red speck. Um, Early amniotes uh, came about, you know, 310 or so million years ago. So this was the age of the dinosaur. Um, the earliest ancestor was about 350 million years ago. Uh, they were all lizards, but they could be anything from a lizard about this big, the nanosaur, which was just written about in a paper in February 2018, to, of course, the T-Rex, right, which is the size of a 10-story building um, and everything in between. 
And so here you have baby chameleon. Aren't they cute? Um, so reptiles uh, have scales made out of keratin, um, which prevents desiccation, right? Desiccation means dehydration. Um, prevents abrasion, right? So they're not constantly getting scratched because they're so low to the ground, right? And they're kind of thinking of a crocodile swaying across the ground and its belly scrapes. And most reptiles... <coughs> <coughs> And most reptiles are ectothermic. Now, ectothermic does not mean that they're cold-blooded. It does not mean that they can't control their body temperature. To be ectothermic, reptiles actually do regulate their body temperature, but they do so using outside factors. So birds and you the mammal, right? You regulate your body temperature uh, internally. You get a fever or your body just kind of has that core temperature of 98.6. But with reptiles, these ectothermic, like crocodiles, chameleons, lizards, um, they might lay in a patch of sun to warm up or go into the shade to cool off, go into the water. Um, so they do a variety of things to regulate their body temperature. Those things just don't involve internal mechanisms. So the true reptiles, extant reptiles, are turtles. Um, nobody knows quite where turtles go. Are they closer to an alligator? Are they closer to a lizard? Um, so the big difference is a turtle versus a tortoise. Uh, turtles can swim and tortoises cannot. It's kind of like the difference between a toad and a frog. So a f toad is a type of frog that's completely terrestrial. A tortoise is a type of turtle that is completely terrestrial. Um, so turtles, right often have their shell, uh, which allow them to retract in for protection. Leptosaurs, it even sounds like a dinosaur, are a species of lizard, um, like the Komodo dragon, um, the Australian thorny devil, right? These are big lizards, not like the little lizards we have around here. So snakes um, are not legless lizards, right? Um, not exactly. So a snake is um, going to have vestigial limbs where it has those uh, tail bones and um, leg bones inside, but they do not have legs on the outside. They completely slither and are their own type of leptidosaur. They are usually uh, carnivorous. Do note a good way to tell the difference between a um, uh, poisonous snake and a non-venomous snake is whether it looks scary or not. All right, archosaurs. So these are the crocodiles and the alligators. These are the closest things you're gonna ever encounter to a dinosaur. You may hear, oh, but a chicken's really close to a dinosaur. Well, it depends on the kind of dinosaur. So um, the chicken's really close to like the, the Tyrannosaurus rex or the raptors. Um, alligators and crocodiles are really close to things like the triceratops, right? Those big waddly lumbering things. Um, so the only species native to North America is the American alligator, Alligator mississippiensis. Um, taking a wild guess from the name you could probably say and you would be correct that this alligator was first identified along the Mississippi River. Archaeosaurs do also include birds. Birds are, have 10,000 species worldwide. Their feathers are adaptations from the reptile scales um, that allow them to fly. Um, some things that birds have developed over time in order to fly, fly properly, um, they don't have a urinary bladder. If you gotta go, you gotta go. Um, and that's because holding on to your urine, right? Like humans, we save it for later until we come across a bathroom. Um, creates excess weight and it's hard to fly when you have excess weight and so they just pee wherever they want. Uh, they do not have teeth because again teeth have weight so birds just swallow their prey whole. Uh, they may rip it to shreds before consuming it. Um, they have a single ovary as opposed to two ovaries like most amniotes um, and again this is because it's lighter to have one This is the basic wing structure. You can see they have a little finger um, coming in to help control their flight and that the um, feathers themselves have the shafts, the barbs, and the hooks, right, to stay linked together so that the bird doesn't come crashing down from the sky. Um, 
it is thought that perhaps the Archaeopteryx uh, on the left was the first bird. Um, they are descended from dinosaurs, specifically uh, pterodactyls. Okay, so do keep that in mind. They are related to pterodactyls. That said, the chicken's also related to the Tyrannosaurus rex. It doesn't fly very well. So some birds are completely flightless, even today. Um, on the left, that is an emu, which is often confused with an ostrich. So the emu is the smaller, more violent cousin to the ostrich. Um, ostriches are really funny in that if they get scared, right, they run and they bury their head in the sand trying to hide from a predator. They have this kind of, if I can't see you, you can't see me mentality. So they run really fast to get away and then hide. Emus will attack, so try not to be aggressive towards an emu. Um, some birds do their flying underwater. If you look at how a penguin swims, it's actually a lot closer to the flight of a bird than it is to swimming of like a fish. Um, hummingbirds on the left have the distinction of being able to fly backwards, um, which is how they stay in place to suck nectar from a flower or a feeder. Um, and flamingos are interesting in that their knees are backwards and they're also filter feeders. You can see this ping, um, this penguin, this flamingo is actually uh, eating. It's sucking brine shrimp out of the water. And so remember, if a flamingo didn't eat shrimp, it would be white. Um, they actually turned pink from the chemicals in the shrimp. And of course, birds are really good at perching on everything. And you think, how does that bird sit on a power line and not kill itself to death? It doesn't get zapped. And the reason it can do that is if both uh, legs, if both sets of claws and feet land on the line at the same time, it creates a grounding effect where the bird is actually carrying the electric current through it. And then if it lifts both its feet off of the line at the same time, it's good to go. The problem that can occur, and you see this sometimes, is if one or the other foot comes off too early, then the bird does get zapped. Um, sometimes you see them land on one foot, and um, when they do land on one foot, right, then they do this like hop skip thing where um, they are switching from foot to foot. Uh, I actually already showed the mating dance of the Birds of Paradise to my Bio 111 class in the spring. Um, so what I would like for you to do is just watch it if you're interested in watching it again or haven't seen it. Mammals! Okay, mammals can lay eggs. Um, which is really kind of weird. And so there's only two species. The platypus, which is not photoed here. There's no picture of it. It has a duck bill and uh, duck feet um, with fur. And then the echidna, which looks like a little cute hedgehog with a snout. Um, some do have pouches. So these are going to be the marsupials. Uh, so kangaroos, the bilby, which is like a small kangaroo, um, koala bears, okay, those are all marsupials. And so Montramata, right, the platypuses and the echidnas, um, they're interesting in that they don't have any nipples. So while they're mammals and they excrete milk from mammary glands, the milk actually goes through their fur and the young suck it from the fur. Uh, with marsupials, they have their mammary glands and their pouches, and so when their babies are born, they just go attached to the mammary gland in the pouch and don't let go until they're fully developed. Um, so urethrins are going to be the traditional mammals that you're used to. You, the human, are considered a urethrin, right? So this is live birth with mammary glands and breast, and the baby is not connected to the mom in any way, nor are they laid by eggs. Um, and they often, <laughs> Uh, have very similar functions to the marsupials that are found in Australia. Um, so Australia is an island, so it has a bunch of endemic species that are not found anywhere else in the world. Um, and interestingly enough, it's missing a lot of the species that we're used to seeing in other parts of the world. So things like the deer mouse, which we have in this area, actually have the plantigale, which is a marsupial equivalent in Australia. So just a different kind of cute little not quite mouse. Um, versus, you know, like the flying squirrel here in Brevard versus the sugar glider, right? The woodchucker groundhog versus the wombat. Are you seeing a theme? 
All right, the types of urethrins. Here we go. You get elephants and manatees. Remember, manatees are the closest living relative to an elephant. The aardvarks, the hyrax, the um, sloths and anteaters, the rabbits, which are very similar to rodents. Rodents are gonna include squirrels, beavers, rats, porcupines, and mice. And then we get into the primates. Uh, people also often confuse a possum for a rodent. Possums are not rodents. They are actually the only marsupial native to North America. Um, so a brief foray into a different chapter. Uh, animal nutrition is very different. Um, remember, a lot of animals need salt in their diet. So how do you get salt or other minerals in your diet if all you're eating are plants? So what a lot of herbivores do, and you see this, like hunters will put out salt licks for deer so that they can hunt healthier deer, or of course they put out salt licks for their horses and their cows. Um, farmers do. Uh, is animals will find those pockets of salt naturally and they'll lick them. And then the carnivores get their salt by eating the herbivores that got the salt. So it's kind of this um, cycle that's going through. Animal nutrition. <laughs> um, let's think about this for a minute. The mouse on the left is really fat and the mouse on the right is not. And that is because one gene was altered in the mouse and the mice were given the same amount of food every single day and the mouse on the right had some self-control and the mouse on the left did not. And so even though they were given the exact same amount of food every day, the mouse on the left ate it all and the mouse on the right did not. It's a genetic link to obesity, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Um, so you can see some mild changes in animals due to domestication. Uh, for example, the cow, goats, that sort of thing have the rumen where they actually eat their, their food twice, um, which allows them to get better digestion and allows them to get fatter. Primates. So how do you tell the difference between a monkey and an ape? Monkey, ape, monkey, ape. So monkeys have tails, long tails. Um, they do not have a lot of social care going on. Um, they don't stay in big groups very often. And when they do stay in big groups, they're more just there to not be alone than they are there to help each other. Um, monkeys are also really good at swinging from tree to tree and hooking onto things with their tails. As opposed to great apes, note the lack of tail. Note their larger size. Note that they have um, jointed thumbs so they can grip onto things better. Um, and also most great apes have some sort of care going on in their cluster. Uh, bonobos even actually uh, will form tools and communicate. So people often say, oh, our closest living relative is the chimpanzee. That's not entirely technically true. Um, we are equally related to chimpanzees and bonobos, we the humans are. Um, and interestingly enough, bonobos are evolving a culture. Uh, scientists have watched bonobos and they've observed as, you know, a female finds a banana tree and calls other bonobos over to share the bananas, whereas if a chimp finds a banana tree, it eats a banana. That's it. Um, no calling over to feed other chimps. Um, with bonobos, the males will actually make rudimentary spears by uh, scraping sticks on rocks and then go hunt small game, um, which is very different. They're also developing a series of grunts and sounds that sound kind of like language. Scientists aren't interfering with bonobos because there's actually some debate now as to whether bonobos should be considered a sentient species. And sentience, of course, means emotion and feeling and starting to get things like legal rights to participate in um, modern society.